Alrighty, folks. This is the first official Modern Meathead talk show slash podcast slash conversation hub uh, episode that we are getting into today. We have my friend Andrew here. Andrew is a personal trainer, but we are going to do some introductory stuff. So just first and foremost, uh, Andrew, tell the people kind of where you're coming from, from the perspective of a little bit about your background in terms of what you're doing now uh, on a day-to-day basis and where you've sort of come from, and then anything else that might be relevant insofar as what your interest in this specific consultation type, type call, you know, uh, is, you know, anything from, uh, you know, the specific topics that you yourself are are interested in uh, for, from you know, from a personal um uh, perspective. And then also just generally speaking, sort of what has led you to be interested in me and then maybe Ethan uh, as as well, just kind of, you know, all that stuff together, I think is a good place to kind of start things off here. Yeah, awesome, man. Yeah. So I'm, I'm my name again, my name is Andrew Griffo. I was born and raised here in Miami, Florida. Um, I kind of got into the fitness industry because I just really enjoy working out, especially being an athlete. I played baseball for about 20 years. I ended up stopping um my run at 24 years old due to a uh, UCL injury that I ended up doing a PRP injection instead of uh, Tommy John. Um, and just in that process, I really fell in love with training and fell in love with, um, you know, especially during the rehab process, trying to get back into it. Um, and I just feel like a lot of times, or especially in the beginning, I, I fell into the, I want to say trap, but I fell into the, uh, what they call functional training, Right where um, I kind of got stewed in a direction where I was doing things like um, from Onnit Academy, you know, with kettlebells and maces and animal flow, if you've ever heard of that kind of stuff. And and um, it always left me with the question, like, what what does this really do? And, and what's the real reason why? And I think along the process, um, along the years, I found different people like you, Ben, um, like Tom, like Joe Bennett, that um, have basically spoke almost in the same way. Um, and it's just made me, it's answered a lot of the questions that I've had in the sense of where it comes from, like biomechanics, anatomy, how things work in tangent together. Um, and, um, so yeah, like the the part of the reason why I wanted, or I'm asking some of these questions is I feel like a lot of the people out there have the same questions that I have. Um, but a lot of it comes from just, so I wanted to understand a little bit deeper into, you know, biomechanics, gut health, nutrition, stuff like that, because I'm also trying to compete in a bodybuilding competition within maybe a year or two from now. Um, so I'm in the process where, you know, I've, I've reached out to Ben um, to help me with some of my programming. Um, I actually worked with you in uh, with Ben in uh, in New York for a session, which was amazing. Uh, learned a lot of stuff from there. And just I wanted, I wanted a deeper, deeper understanding of everything that, you know, comes along with biomechanics, physics, anatomy, and how it all kinds of com- uh, comes to playing together. Um, and then of course, like, you know, changing your body composition obviously has a lot to do with your nutrition and gut health. And and I've learned a lot from my personal coach, um, Jordan, that, you know, gut health is, you know, really, really important, especially on like how fast you're going to see progress. So, um, and, you know, the state, of, the state that your gut is in to absorb some of those nutrients and all that. So, um, yeah, a lot of my questions are coming more from like a deeper, wanting to have a deeper understanding from, you know, two guys that I know are, are very, very knowledgeable in, in biomechanics and nutrition. Um, and yeah, just take it from there, basically. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Ethan, you wanted to start us off? Yeah, Andrew, nice to meet you uh, virtually here. I know we've like crossed paths in the gym, but uh, it's yeah. cool to get to talk to you. Absolutely. Um, I was wondering, like, along this journey, like, on the route to your first competition here, like, have you run into any stop gaps at this point? Like, anything where um, you've been limited in your performance or your health? Like, anything that's kept you, you know, from getting to uh, that goal? Like, you mentioned the UCL injury in baseball. Has there been anything so far from a bodybuilding standpoint where you've uh, run into some issues? Not in a bodybuilding standpoint, but I think I started a little bit behind track because when I was done with baseball, I was pretty heavy. I was around 205. I'm not heavy, but I was pretty normal size. Um, and then I went into boxing. And boxing, you know, to be 5'11", you got to fight at like 160, 165. So I had to drop a good 40 pounds. And in boxing, you know, they, they don't really promote weight training or, you know, lifting or anything like that. It's mainly just cardio and trying to get as light as possible to be as quick as possible. 
Um, so I feel like I kind of started a little bit behind track, but once I got, I would say two years ago, I got into wanting to do a bodybuilding competition and hired my first coach, Jordan. Um, for, I remember the first thing I told him was like, yeah, man, I want to compete. Like how many weeks out am I? He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. chill. Like <laughs> if you really want to compete and I just participate, you're about three years away. And I'm like, oh shit. All right. So this is going to be longer than I thought. And along the process, you know, we've, we've done, you know, our, our bulk phase, our growth phase, and then our maintenance phase or health phase. And kind of gone back and forth trying to put on muscle and then, you know, clean up some health markers. And in the last bulk phase, um, we noticed a lot of a lot of inflammation in my body, a lot of inflammation in my physique. So um, we ended up doing a stool test where it came back um, that I had high SIBO levels and high H. pyori levels, which um, he also told me like H. pyori is, is has a link to like colon cancer and stuff like that. So this isn't just about like a gut health thing this is like about an overall health thing, you know? And um, I think that's one of the biggest hiccups we've had where it's kind of, um, I want to say stopped our progress because, you know, we're trying to get our, our gut into a better, better position to, you know, absorb nutrients and move forward. But I've been in this process for about 14 weeks now where, you know, I'm very limited on some of the foods I can have. Like, you know, I'm basically eating like ground beef, potatoes, rice, you know, some veg vegetables, and I'm taking a shitload of digestive supplements um, to kind of help, you know, the process of cleaning out my gut bacteria and getting me into a better state. Um, so that, I would say that's the one thing or the main thing that's kind of like put a halt in us moving forward, like into another bulk phase. Cause I just need to clean out my gut issues and make sure that when we retest, a lot of those levels are lower or gone, you know? And I want to give credit to, uh, who Jordan is, uh, what, what's Jordan's last name? Plantico. He's from Wisconsin. He's an IFBB pro and classic as well. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you already started off by just in introducing this idea of, you know, this is a long term process. Was that idea of like a three year plan something that was kind of new to you or was that familiar from like your sporting background? No, absolutely. It was new to me, man. I, I, I think one of the biggest things, I mean, especially here in Miami is that you know, you hear people saying, oh, I'm going to go into a prep. And, and I just feel like a lot of people down here don't don't really understand the 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 work that it takes to really compete. And like my goal was to always go. I want to go pro. You know, that's that's my main goal, not not to necessarily be on the Olympia stage. Like if that's that's what happens down the road, you know, cool. Right. But I just wanted to go pro. And, and I always thought that, you know, I would see all these people just jumping right into a prep oh, 20 weeks out, 24 weeks out. And I thought that's what was going to happen. You know, me just all right, let's just start eating a lot better. You know, in 20 weeks, I'll be able to jump on stage and, and compete. But, you know, it's like what he told me, there's a difference between participating and competing, right? Like, are you going just to stand there and and, and show off whatever physique you can bring? Or you want to go out there and compete and try to win first place? And for the background that I came from, like sports and, and raised by my father, who's very, very competitive himself, I always want to win. You know what I mean? I've always wanted to come out on top. And, and if I'm going to do something, I want to do it right so it was a big shock to me that it was going to take three years. But during this process, I realized like it's it's really not that easy to build your physique like some of these guys look on stage. Like I think it doesn't it doesn't give bodybuilders enough credit um, to the amount of work they put in with PEDs or not, um, because it just, it, you know, building muscle is, is a slow process. You know what I mean? Especially the more consistent you are, the, the you know, I guess the faster it'll, it'll be. But um, I just feel like, you know, a lot of people don't have that discipline to to stay in there for three or four years trying to reach that goal. Um, and that was kind of a shocker to me. And, and I realized, you know, after talking to Jordan, um, I realized, you know, this is going to take some more time, but this is what I really want to do. This is my goal. You know, it is what it is. Yeah. <clears throat> and are there any major questions like in starting this process that, you know, kind of stood out to you, whether it be from a training standpoint, nutrition, lifestyle, um, you know, that might be interesting for the the people listening to this podcast. Any questions? Um, no, not necessarily, but a lot of things that I didn't even think about, especially at the beginning, like I do now, like, you know, mitigating stress, you know, obviously your gut health is, is super important, but I mean, mitigating stress, um, I, I know is one thing that we've worked on a lot because I've had some stressful events come up between, you know, um, some health problems in the family to me even closing my gym um, that I had opened not too long ago. 
Um, you know, so I think that was another thing that really, really shocked me was like, I didn't know how much stress played into, you know, obviously developing your physique to just another level. Um, and, and also sleep, sleep and recovery. Like a lot of times, you know, you hear people say team, no sleep, or you just need six hours of sleep and this and that. And, and I feel like, you know, especially in my growth phase, like we really emphasize sleep and, and, and it's like, Hey man, you got to get at least, I mean, at the minimum seven hours, but I'm always trying to shoot for like eight or nine. You know, and I, ha I have a different lifestyle where I do trained in the morning, like early in the morning, like 5, 6 a.m. So I got to get to bed real early just to be able to do that, you know, to get those hours of sleep. So those are some of the things that I didn't really have questions about him because I didn't really know. But once he taught me them and then we got into the process of doing some of those things and, and our check ins, I would tell him, yeah, I only got like five hours of sleep last night. He's like, well, hey, we got to cut that. We got to try to get some more sleep in there, especially if we're in this growth phase, you know, um, so. Yeah, it was kind of like on the go. I had I had questions, you can say, but it was more of like me, him telling me and learning from like our check ins um, and then just going, taking it from there and getting better at everything that we, we were trying to implement. Ben, is there anything like from talking to Andrew in person? I know Andrew mentioned he had done some consults around biomechanics with you. Is there anything that you guys discussed um, <clears throat> that he may have brought up there? in terms of big picture concepts that could kind of get us started off today? Um, so, I mean, insofar as big picture concepts, I think Andrew is one of, you know, because there, there are a lot of different categories of questions. There are the questions that sort of start out um, so broad that you need, you know, five or six follow-ups to really hone in on like what the actual needs of, of the person are. But Andrew wasn't really at a point, at least insofar as I could tell that that was really what was, um, you know, that that was what needed to happen, meaning that he had more specific issues that he came in for. And so we were more so specifically addressing those issues just from from a biomechanic stuff, which we could, I think, get into a little bit later. But I actually think that a good place to start here uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, just, an just answering some stuff a little bit more concretely is this topic around gut health, because I I, I haven't really invested any time as, as both of you know, in, uh, in, in the nutrition space. And obviously Ethan, you, you have, and, uh, one of the things that I think I've heard tossed around a lot specifically in the nutrition space on social media, I know you're not on social media, E, but something that is talked about a lot is this topic of gut health. It's like a very hot topic. And I almost, when I hear gut health, I almost have one of those like throw up sort of reactions where I'm like, Ugh, like this is like the, the sort of biomechanics equivalent of, of like the functional movement, you know, to me where it's like, it's, it's a term and it's like, okay, cool. It's a term gut health. We know what gut health kind of means, but Ethan, when you hear that kind of what, what do you start to think about in terms of, you know, uh, the question around gut health insofar as, is it something that is really, really uh, of a high level of, of importance. And what does it really mean to you specifically when we say like defining our terms, like what is gut health? Um, I think you sort of starting off in any direction uh, in relationship to that would be a good idea specifically because it is specific to Andrew and Andrew can maybe answer some questions about what kinds of specific problems that he's had uh, in, in response to anything that you have to say. Yeah, so much like yourself, gut health, you know, is, is not a specific area of expertise. So when I'm speaking about this topic, it's really, these are my personal experiences. These are my experiences with clients. These are uh, the experiences I've had doing consultations uh, with people who are experts in this area and uh, going through many of the problems, Andrew, that you're experiencing now or are soon to likely experience as well. Um <laughs> When I hear experts on any topic speak, when it's um, a very specific uh, topic, something, you know, that, uh, you know, in the world of sports performance, like specificity is moving from, you know, like grade school level education to basically like PhD level education. So you can kind of compare like moving ever and ever closer as an athlete towards exactly what you want to do in your sport to an education where you're learning math, you're learning biology, you're learning like all the fundamental concepts that'll one day get you to the point where you could be specific about a concept like, for example, like one type of bacteria or one specifically like 
uh, protein metabolism as it relates to skeletal muscle hypertrophy. So the people that are experts in a field are very, very specific, but they also tend to be very, very uncertain. And that's one way you can identify an expert when they're willing to say, you know, we don't have sufficient evidence right now to really say one way or another, but here's the direction that things are pointing. And here is at least, you know, a rationale to start from. So I would say, especially in the world of gut health, like <clears throat> compared to other fields, it seems to be somewhat in its infancy as it relates to practical application. You know, there's plenty of underlying science I think people can lean on and say, like, this might be what happens because we have a basis for understanding in this field. But I think as it relates to the applications we're interested in, you know, getting to um, a, a certain presentation on a bodybuilding stage, you know, we're leaps and bounds, you know, uh, you know, behind getting to that point. So I think that's important to identify that, like, the specific application that we're talking about is not something that, you know, is directly being studied right now. Whereas in the exercise science realm, it's cool because people like Brad Schoenfield, for example, um, have been doing research now for, you know, over a decade that is actually very specific to what we care about. So again, when, you know, when I'm speaking about a topic like gut health, that is something I've come across, but it's not a specific area of expertise and, and nor is anything really in this field. This is all stuff that I've pursued because I also wanted to be a, a pro bodybuilder. And in order to get there, I had to ask these questions and find those people along the way. Um, but what I would say as a comparison to other, um, you know, other realms, like in this, um, in this fitness avenue would be that avoiding uh, problems, like uh, avoiding the minimizing the stressors tends to be more relevant than cleaning up the spills afterwards. So oftentimes people use the analogy of like plugging the leak versus cleaning up the floor. And I think, you know, as we talk about biomechanics today, that'll become relevant is like, you know, there's some level of tolerance that we have for any type of stressor. And based on our genetics, based on, you know, the environment we've been exposed to, we may be closer or further from that tipping point where that stressor becomes, you know, overwhelming for us to adapt to. So I think it's similar here in, with gut health. Like, for example, you know, right now in New York, we've had a lot of air pollution because of the forest fires up in Canada. And if you go on your iPhone and you look at the weather app, you'll see like, oh, the you know, air quality right now is 150. And, you know, it, it'll say like, that's a problem for sensitive, you know, individuals. And that means, you know, there's someone out there who when they're exposed to that, it's a big problem. But for the average person, you know, young, healthy, no pre-existing conditions, it's, it's not a problem. So it's similar here where there's like some level of exposure of certain things that are ultimately going to exceed our tolerance, cross that tipping point, and I think we'll find time and time again that it's more about minimizing the exposure to the things we're sensitive to than it is uh, about cleaning up the problem after the fact. So right now, Andrew, you're in a place where you're taking all of these supplements, you know, to correct what's perceived as a deficit. And it may be um, that you have some specific, you know, underlying conditions that have always been there regardless of what you've done and forever you'll need to have some type of buttress against that. You'll need to have some sort of supporting factors that help, you know, protect you from those deficits. Yeah. But more likely than not, what you find is that the, your behaviors over time have created an inroad uh, to your recovery in a particular system, whether it be you threw a lot of pitches and your elbow hurt or whether it be you ate a lot of a certain type of food uh, in a specific type of condition that might be under stress, um, might be lack of sleep, but the conditions are such that like doing those behaviors repetitively eventually, you know, cause more and more insult to injury that you weren't able uh, to adapt to. And now you're in a place where you're picking up the pieces. So 
I think more than anything, when we have a topic like gut health that, you know, for our purposes is very much in its infancy, we have to rely on, you know, models that we see in other areas where we say, all right, the first thing we need to pay attention to, whether it be injury to a joint or injury, you know, uh, to an organ per se, is how do we minimize insult to injury? How do we minimize, you know, the cost that we're paying every single day versus how do we add more things to help ourselves? So I think just as a generalization, what you'll find, and, and you're going through this like elimination style diet right now where you're taking things out, I think the initial steps are always going to be finding out what those insulting factors are, pulling them out, whether they be per particular foods, whether it be the way that you're eating those foods, whether it be uh, outside environmental factors like lifestyle stresses and sleep, but all of those things come together and, you know, essentially determine whether or not you can adapt to that stressor. So again, I think the main focus here has to be on being able to measure or at least subjectively identify what the problem is and minimizing that first rather than putting more stuff on top. Yeah. So Andrew, what have you found in terms of your results from this uh, elimination diet just for the last, I think you mentioned like 12 or, or so weeks or maybe a little longer. Uh, what have you kind of found from that as a result of, of, of that process and um, how, how are things going right now? Um, so I, we, uh, basically, uh, have eliminated, you know, I, I wouldn't say eliminated, but we just have, you know, focused on a certain amount of food and stuff like that, but I've lost a good 14 pounds. I was, I remember at the beginning of this, um, gut health phase, I was at like two or five and now I'm at like 191. Um, and a lot of it, I would say like at least seven pounds of it is probably from inflammation. You know, I'm obviously in a little bit of a caloric deficit, especially on my rest days where, I think I'm sitting at like 2,300 calories and on workout days, I'm sitting at 3,000 calories. Um, so I've lost a good amount of body fat, but I think a lot of it has come from inflammation. I just feel way tighter, um, definitely not as bloated. Um, and a lot of times, like we even took out, he was giving me organic orange juice. And after a while of drinking that, I started to feel a little bloated again. And we took that out. Um, so it's kind of like, I've been, I've been going through this for like a good 12 weeks. We went through like this first uh, phase of the kill phase. Um, and I honestly feel 20 times better. I mean, my body feels better. Uh, my energy's better. I obviously feel a lot tighter. Uh, body fat has dropped. I mean, I, I'm seeing a lot more uh, definition in my physique and my, in my midsection, even in my legs, I'm getting a lot more vascularity in my legs that I didn't have before. Um, so it's been, it's been a, a pretty interesting process even though it's been very hard because i'm not i'm not allowed to have any like free untracked meals right now i've had an, i haven't had any for like the last 14 weeks um and that's been very difficult you know not being able to look at, look forward to a cheat meal every week but um but it's been i think it's been really beneficial in the sense of uh putting my my body or my my gut and everything into a better state to be able to go back into a bulk phase or a growth phase in the future um, and one of my questions that I, that I had, I don't know if, if this is going to be part of the podcast, but is like, how does this affect nutrient absorption? You know what I mean? Like how, how much better am I going to be in a state to absorb these nutrients when I'm at a higher, um, caloric intake and I'm needing a lot more carbs and all that stuff. So, um, it's been a, it's been a, a hard process, but it's been very beneficial. And I've seen a lot of, a lot of progress from it. Um, again, from my physique to my energy, to the way I'm, I'm reacting to different foods and everything. So it's been, it's been pretty good. Cool. And just because Ethan's a little laggy right now, I'll wait till he's not laggy. Um, I think that one of the, um, really cool things about that too, is you kind of just, uh, become more and more aware over time of, of your sensitivities, not necessarily only because you start to eliminate things, but also because you actually just start to pay much closer attention, you know, like the, the, the feeling, and just to clarify, when you say tightness, you don't mean like my hamstrings are tight, right? You mean like, yeah, you, you, you mean like, I feel like I'm more jacked and I feel like my muscles are bigger. Yeah. Um, so just for anyone maybe confused about that, um, yeah, I think those kinds of markers, and that's one of the the biggest takeaways that I have had nutrition wise when it comes to my interactions with Ethan is just over time paying more and more attention to those 
you know, because in, in some sense, they're subjective, right? Everything is subjectively perceived. But in another, it's like you, you, you kind of know when your stomach feels like shit, you know, when your poops are good, uh, you, you, you know, when things are just, you know, it's almost like you eat a meal and you go on a walk and you're like almost hungry immediately. Like that kind of thing is uh, to me, at least along that process of gaining and losing weight, I think was always uh, something that I, I never really paid attention to. So I think there's, I think if there's anything to be taken away from just the gut health stuff in general is elimination is, is one way to do it, but really just paying attention uh, and, and being mindful about what you feel like after you eat, um, I think was for me, one of the biggest things It's just like, Oh, do I, you know, do I feel like shit after I eat this food? Uh, and I, and I, because I think a lot of people uh, just feel like shit all the time. Uh, especially people who maybe are getting into this world who don't have a ton of education around any of these topics is like, they, they it's just kind of like an expectation that they don't feel good. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty cool to kind of see some of those changes, even again, just, just uh, paying mind to it. So Andrew, so one of the things that you mentioned earlier was your introduction to, um, the fitness world and realm being in sort of the functional movement. Uh, and, and that's always an interesting, uh, topic of, of conversation to me. I want to talk a little bit more uh, about that and maybe give some perspectives on it. Um, but did you just want to ask anything specific in relationship to that I idea of the functional movement thing and what specifically you mean by it? Yeah. Like when I, when I first got into, um, into training outside of baseball, you know, and training with the general population, um, a lot of the times I would hear is like, you know, functional training is, you know, mimicking movements that people do on a daily basis, right? Like if people are going to pick up a case of water, like you're going to want to deadlift, you know, if people open doors, like their car door, or their door to their house, like you're going to want to do rows. Um, you know, we're, we're more, you know, quad dominant and, and push dominant than we are, you know, hip dominant. And you're going to want to, because people sit all day, you're going to want to train their glutes and hamstrings, you know, to get them out of an anterior pelvic tilt. And this is kind of the stuff I used to hear. And I kind of, you know, obviously not knowing any better, kind of bought into it at the beginning. Um, and then as I started to learn, and honestly, I got uh, introduced to RTS. Um, and hearing Tom just in the prerequisite of videos, like just like completely debunk some of these fucking myths. Um, I kind of was like, wow, like, I can't believe I, I believe some of this stuff that, you know, sounds great when you don't know anything, but when you hear it, somebody else elaborate on it that actually knows what they're talking about. It's like, this makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, so my, one of my questions was, was like, where, where does this misunderstanding of functional training mimicking everyday life comes from? And like, why has the fitness industry, especially general population geared so much more towards like finding functional trainers and, and getting into functional training itself, um, where they think it's more beneficial, but you ask them, like, what are your main goals? And all, most of them say, 90% of them say, I want to change my physique. I want to look better naked. I want to build muscle. I want to get stronger. And like, yeah, I mean, doing deadlifts will kind of get, you know, they'll get you stronger. But, you know, it's just, I think it's more of a generalized um, concept and mis or misconcept where people think like, oh, okay, again, picking up a case of water. If I do deadlifts, I'm not going to hurt my back picking up a case of water kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and cause this is really, this is a really, really big topic. I think for, uh, that's important for people to understand because, um, you know, and, and keep me on track here. Cause there's a lot of different parts that I want to cover to this. Both of you keep, you know, I'm asking you to keep me on track here, but like when I hear, functional movement usually people don't say movement they usually say you know this exercise is either functional or not functional and if if we took away the whole trademark of like functional training animal flow whatever you want to whatever it is um you know the word functional like if something is functional it means that like it works for what it's in, supposed to do like if if my laptop is functional my laptop you know shows you guys on the screen and and you know translates the audio appropriately and all that stuff so i th i find it funny like a lot of these kind of uh, catchy phrases that, that like they they mean so many things that they mean like nothing or the definitions are just you know circular like functional training is functional training is functional training so I think, and in, in you mentioned Tom and RTS, the, the, the really good place to start with this question is just kind of understanding like how, uh, how we actually function, how we actually move to talk about, you know, the, even just using the specific word, uh, 
Um, and then also just sort of the differentiation between skills and uh, muscular development, because I think that's really a conversation that needs to come hand in hand with this one. So the first thing is that uh, muscles only do you know one thing ultimately is that is they contract right whether whether they're moving into a more lengthened position or a more shortened position ultimately there's point a and there's point b you know assuming we're talking about you know a muscle that just has one main origin insertion right but it can be multiple and those points just pull together right so you know what we typically think of as muscular function is like we look down in a textbook and we see, okay, you know, this muscle origin insertion, and it does this joint action, right? And, and so we give those contractions names. We say this muscle does this thing. And despite, and, and I think that's part of the limitation in, in people's learning and understanding with this stuff is like, they'll see one representation of the body in this one single position. And they'll say, this muscle does this one thing. And if I'm not doing that exact one thing from this one position, then it's either I'm confused or um, I'm doing something that's completely distinct uh, in, in all ways. So when we look at this at the, the sort of local level, the local muscular level, the muscles just contract they they just they just pull together right and so regardless of whether you are doing a deadlift or a leg extension uh or a squat or you're you know sitting down on the toilet to take a shit like your muscles are are contracting right in one way or another so that's the starting point is that there's no magical mystical element to you know doing any sort of joint action outside of just we're, we're contracting muscles okay so that's the first thing the second thing in relationship to this is the differentiation between a skill. Okay. So let's say, you know, the skill of I'm walking into my kitchen and I need to grab this, you know, glass from the, uh, from the cabinet. So I, oh, I need to open the cabinet and I need to do this. Some people have trouble getting their arm up here, you know, to grab. So the thought is like, okay, if I, if I want to improve that, that motion, then I should just you know, do that motion over and over again. And not only should I do that motion over and over again, but when I'm in the gym, I should actually find a way to load the motion or load something that just looks like the motion. And because we're so visually driven, our assumption is if I do this thing in the gym that looks the same as this thing at home, right? If any, if this people are watching, they'll see me doing this hand up thing. If people are listening, I'm reaching, you know, I'm reaching upward <laughs> over and over. Uh, you know, if I, if I go in the gym and I load that motion, then that's going to be the best thing to accomplish this specific scenario. So much in the same way, and maybe a, a more concrete um, example that most people can relate to. And maybe I've heard the discussion around is like the, the whole leg extension versus like, you know, uh, uh, functional stuff uh, as it relates to, you know, things like squatting and sitting down and standing up. Okay. So when I'm doing a leg extension, my quads are contracting. And when I am uh, sitting down or standing up, my quads are also contracting. And the difference between those two things is really just the specific skill. So I look at the, just the contraction you know, side of things completely devoid of the skill as, okay, what are the sort of, what are the hardware pieces to this thing happening? What are the, what are the things that are involved in any particular motion and any particular contraction? And how can I best and most, specifically improve those things. So whether or not I am, you know, looking at improving a squat to take my shit or whether I'm looking to just improve my my quad strength and my quad size, the leg extension is essentially just a way to sort of expedite the process of achieving the specific hardware outcome. Meaning that, you know, if 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 either I mean I know Ethan you used to play video games when you were very young, but like not any, you know, currently trendy video games. A lot of time the model for video games is basically like you have your character and your character has gear, right? But then there's also like, so you can get better gear in the game and like your stats, you can move your stats in the right direction. You can get stronger as a character, your health can increase, whatever. But then there's also like the skill of the game where you're fighting other people and you're killing other people in the game, right? And so what people have done is they've completely ignored the whole getting better gear aspect. And they only, th they only think that the thing itself, the playing the game itself is the thing that will actually improve the function. But what we see over and over again, both in terms of actual strength output and strength display, like for instance, in a sport like powerlifting or, or in, in field sports with kids who are younger, 
when you make those specific units of the gear stronger, when you improve your stats, right? When you improve the hardware, what you end up having is a much uh, is a is a much better transfer, we'll say, of uh, those motions to actual skills as compared to skills that are basically just shittier versions of themselves, right? So in the example of you know reaching for the glass, it's like maybe you go into the gym and you and you and you load that motion like we were you know mentioning earlier. But maybe what you do is you look at that specific skill and you say, okay, what are the hardware elements? What are the pieces of gear that are sort of involved in this motion? And if you can identify which muscles are involved in a particular motion and you go over to this other place and you improve their ability to contract, which is all, again, that we can ultimately influence, then your transfer between those two activities should be almost very direct, assuming that you're actually doing the skill, right? So the idea that we need to like take all of these different skills outside of the context completely of, of where they're done, which is totally like a force specific thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're essentially like, I think a good uh, analogy uh, for this also, because you're a baseball guy would be the whole baseball conversation around like people in the batter's box uh, swinging like really heavy metal objects. I used to have to do that when I was a kid is like picking up a 40 pound, like metal yeah. bar. And what you realize very quickly, especially like if you take that too far, is you're doing a completely different motion than you would in the circumstance where you were just holding a regular bat. So people in the MLB can swing a regular bat like God knows how fast, right? And almost and like it, uh, such a high, just such a high velocity that like you don't see the bat kind of a thing, right? You don't, you don't see them swinging, you know, 50 pound poles in the batter's box because the motion is completely distinct. So the motion is only good for training the skill of the motion. And this applies to a thousand different things. But if you, if you give an MLB batter a 50 pound bat, what they're going to recognize very quickly is that the actual skill that they're performing is very, very distinct. So taking it back to the actual like life, you know, functional movement activities, it's like the confusion is really around the fact that the only thing that actually improves the skill is the skill itself and anything else, any deviation in the force scenario that you're creating and training a motion, whether it be the specific load that you're using, whether it be the specific path of motion that you're using, the sequence of events, you know, that occur in the motion. What you ultimately have, what it ultimately comes down to, to me is figuring out what specific skill you're trying to improve and then pruning, improving the units of that skill, i.e. identifying the muscles that you want to train and then actually just loading them in a specific path of motion and with a specific amount of loading so that when you go back to that skill, that muscle only knows contraction and that muscle can say, okay, I've learned how to appropriately contract in this other scenario. I've learned how to appropriately lengthen and I've learned how to maintain actually this, this tension and this coordination in this other scenario. So again, I think the biggest takeaway is just the idea of improving the skill for the skill and then improving the hardware, improving the gear, improving all of the things that actually make up the, uh, the contractile uh, uh, elements uh, and, and sort of seeing a transfer uh, from there. So that was um, a lot of sort of bouncing around. Hopefully there were some useful takeaways to that, Ethan. I don't know if you had any sort of clarifying questions or Andrew, if you had any clarifying questions about that. Actually, I used to actually swing a donut in the batter's box and out in the on deck circle. You know, you put mm -hmm. that, that little heavy thing that goes on the barrel. Oh yeah. To swing it and be like, damn, my hands can whip pretty good, but you know, you grab the, you take it off and you grab the bat. Yeah. It feels a little lighter, but you're right. It changes the complete skill of what, what you're trying to do. Yeah. And I kind of, I kind of view it as like, um, the, the skill itself is really the interaction and the coordination of the contractions exactly. and the training side of things, right? So doing the leg extension to improve this 80 year old person's ability to stand up out of a chair, right? We, you know, and Tom specifically has talked about that a lot is like, what do you do if you're in a situation where the person actually can't perform the skill? How are you supposed to improve the skill? The only way that you can do it is by improving the fundamental units, the bedrock of what allows the skill to occur in the first place. So I think the the major take home with this is, you know, in the gym and in a more resistance training specific scenario, what we're really attempting to do is we're just attempting to improve the contraction and the skill. What the skill is doing is it's not directly improving the skill of the contraction. It's improving the coordination of the contraction with all of the other contractions that need to occur at the same time. 
So this is why people add ridiculous amounts of load to a new exercise every single time that they do it within the first couple of weeks is because what you're, what you're not only learning to do is improve the contraction in the specific scenario of the specific muscle that you're using, but you're also learning to do things like downregulate other muscles that may actually counter the motion, right? Uh, antagonist muscles, right? So if I'm doing a press, all of the muscles that perform a, a, what we look at as a traditional pull will stabilize you know, those joints to, to some degree. And initially when you have people do presses, sometimes they freak out, sometimes their hands are wiggling, sometimes you know, they're not pressing in a direction you want them to press. And it's because of that coordinative element of all the other tissues contributing that might potentially contribute to the motion that you don't want to be the primary things trying to contribute to the motion. So right. to me, um, you know, the skill is is something that is completely distinct from the actual improving of, of contraction. And, and what improving the contraction ultimately does is it just improves the sort of hardware that we're actually um, you know, working with in, in the scale. And I think the baseball example is a really good one because you change one, one portion of a variable in a skill and the skill is a completely different thing. This is why, like, this is why you don't see MLB pitchers throw like, you know, to improve their pitch, they're not throwing, you know, 15 pound baseballs, right? Yeah. Because they know if they picked up a 15 pound baseball and tried to throw it that, you know, either something really bad would happen um, or they would have to downregulate so many things that, you know, they throw it, you know, a percentage as fast as they normally would. Right. Yeah. So um, I think that if that were a concept that actually held held in, in any sort of real, you know, uh, sub substantiated way, what we would see in professional sport is just like all of the skills of people uh, in sport, just doing it with heavier weights. Right. Because more is, is yeah. better or something like that. Um, Ethan, any comments? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the people that, you know, I speak to on a daily basis are people from the general population who, you know, don't have sport specific goals. I mean, maybe some of them play like tennis on the weekends or golf or, or what have you. But when it comes to the demands of just, um, you know, surviving in our, our current environment, like you said earlier, Ben, like reaching for a glass, like sitting down to go to the bathroom, I think just the requisite uh, amount of skill that you need to have uh, for a lot of those activities is, is very, very low. And um, usually the degradation of that, you know, the loss in that function comes from, um, you know, some type of incident that may be caused like, you know, an acute injury or like the only way they really tend to lose it over time, you know, is by not doing it anymore. So for example, someone has an injury and they stop running and they go, you know, 10, 15 years without running and then they want to get back into running again. And it's a very long uphill battle, um, you know, to start becoming accustomed to those uh, type of stresses again. Um, so for a lot of the people that I work with, that barrier to be functional or the, uh, the as you say, the threshold to be functional is very, very low. And, you know, when we're looking for like, uh, limiters to their health, like what is ultimately like the thing that's going to impact their um, quality of life or their, you know, duration of life, if we can have an impact on those things. Um, oftentimes, you know, we're talking about things like their cardiorespiratory fitness, uh, the amount of muscle mass they have, the amount of strength that they have. And really the the threshold for each of those things is very very low uh in order just to live a high quality of life so i don't that's all to say like i don't think there is this like high degree of specificity in the general population to be functional um i think a lot of it is just you not screwing them up because i think more often than not as trainers whether it be for a professional baseball player that's already at the top of their game or whether it be for um you know someone in the general population that's you know currently healthy uh we're more likely to you know mess them up in the gym because of the uh, just total quantity of you know stress that we're um you know that we're hitting them with versus what they're experiencing in their day-to-day -day life so i think you know more often than not for us it's actually kind of just like 
we're, we're our own worst enemy and we're actually um, providing them with the greatest amount of stress that they experience in their life. So if anything, they're likely to, you know, cross that tipping point, so to speak, in the gym, not in their day-to-day -day life. They are overpowered for their day-to-day -day life in terms of what we're trying to provide them with in the gym to, you know, look like a, a quasi bodybuilder, so to speak. Um, and I think when we get more specific, it's often when someone's coming in with a specific issue, they have an injury or in an area, or like Ben was saying earlier, there's a particular activity that they can no longer do. So that's usually where we have to get more specific from a quote unquote functional level is the function is something they can no longer do. And because they can no longer do it, they can't train it. And if they can't train it, that means we have to find the things that um, make up that um, that make up that movement. The things that sort of uh, Ben knows I like the word uh, amalgamate um, to you know form you know that uh, you know that quote unquote function. And um, it's on us to sort of like pick activities that are within their wheelhouse to do. Or, you know, you mentioned Tom earlier, Tom would say things that they have, uh, things that they own, you know, or can control, and things that they tolerate. And once we find those things, we we train those things. And, um, you know, we try to reincorporate it back into what is usually a pretty low level skill, you know, in their day to day life. And it's not even uncommon, Andrew, for people like you to have the goal of being able to do a specific exercise where someone comes to us for a consultation and says, you know, I can squat down to the toilet, but when I back squat, it hurts. When I bench press, it hurts. So most often in our realm, it's someone has a specific function that they can't do. So we can't train it. And then we have to break it down and we have to identify what the constituent parts are, what the limiter to that activity is, so it very rarely is it mimicking that thing. Um, yeah. Oftentimes it might be doing that thing and saying, oh, it, it hurts now. What can we identify as potentially like the reason that might be hurting or since very often we can never really know that we simply um, test and retest areas that, you know, are quote unquote, have an uh, inability uh, to, to do, or we find areas that are painful and try to do them without pain. So it's simply just this test retest scenario where we're seeing again, like what do they have available to them today? And how can we train what we believe in that moment to be a limitation to that and then retest and see if that then, you know, um, solves, you know, the, uh, the problem of function that they had. Gotcha. Yeah. And so one of the things, Ethan, that you mentioned that was sort of amongst that was this idea of quantity and uh, basically just finding ways not to fuck people up. Uh, and so that brings us, I think, because Andrew had a, a, a question about progressive overload and the concepts related to uh, you know, just the idea of it and, and specifically how the term progressive overload is is kind of thrown around and tossed around as like a, a smoke bomb term for just anything that is, you know, means getting bigger. But you and I often talk uh, about this idea of progressive overload and how oftentimes we do not see an association between progression and an exercise and outcome in hypertrophy. And I think that that's something that is rarely talked about there always seems to be this underlying assumption that if i progressive overload if i add load to these exercises and i get stronger i will get bigger uh and in fact we rarely you know i mean the strongest people on on earth are are usually not you know they don't look like bodybuilders they they're they're powerlifters so um and that's you know strength being a different conversation but just from the standpoint of progressive overload what kind of comes to mind in relationship to um you know, the topic of load progression specifically, because I think that's what most people kind of think of as, you know, the way to add more stress to training. Uh, but sort of just your framework, I'm interested in hearing you talk about, uh, you know, the topic of progressive overload and kind of what your, uh, you know, framework for that happens to be in relationship to uh, bodybuilding training. Mm 
Got it. Yeah. So just to give a little bit of context to this, like I know Andrew had kind of discussed with us, you know, before we started recording, just like the general topics we wanted to cover today. So that's kind of where that came up, like in that progressive overload component. Um, Andrew, can you, just so I can be more specific to the question, give me a little bit of backstory on like um, where that's shown up for you, where it's been relevant in your training and just kind of how you came about um, investigating that topic of, of progressive overload. Yeah, when I first heard of progressive overload, you know, getting into weight training and stuff like that, I thought it was just, you know, increasing weight each week, increasing weight every other week or something like that. And, you know, when you think about it, it's like, can I really increase 10 pounds a week? I mean, you know, my bench press would be crazy by the end of the year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's no way because I would, I would end up hitting a, I would say not a, not a plateau, I would end up hitting a, a level where, all right, this is as max as I can do. And I'd be stuck there for weeks or months on end. And, you know, just learning more um, by just researching more and learning from Ben and Tom and all these guys is like, there's more than just adding load, right? There's adding a rep, there's adding, um, you know, more, more intention, you know? And so my, my, my question came from like, you know, what are the other forms or ways of progressive overload besides just adding weight? And um, how do, how, how does that really go into play with like, especially bodybuilders, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think we all, most of us at least, you know, start in that place where when you hear the word load, we think of, of weight, you know, there definitely is, you know, uh, they definitely are synonymous in, in many ways. And it is the, the easiest thing to measure in many ways too. We say, well, you know, if I add, uh, you know, a few pounds to the bar, I can objectively say I did more. And, when we don't really understand all the factors that go into, you know, creating this ultimate stimulus that produces muscle growth. Um, I think that idea of being able to measure something, at least for myself and my personality was very important early on. It's like, you know, for me, a large part of this bodybuilding process is like being able to influence the factors that eventually, you know, create the outcome I'm looking for. And I think that's a cool thing to be able to do in life. You know, I just watched the uh, Netflix Arnold documentary uh, last night. Highly recommend it. But mm -hmm. like, that's kind of his whole thing is like, you know, he had this, this vision and uh, he knew exactly where he wanted to be. And he was going to control all of the factors, you know, that went into that so that he could ultimately be exactly where he imagined himself being. And, and I think, you know, when you hear a little bit in the documentary about like what his upbringing was and as you meet a lot of bodybuilders or, you know, e even athletes, um, you hear a lot of these backstories where it's like, man, we really just wanted to like have some degree of, you know, control and like self-determination around uh, the way things are going in our lives. So I think this idea of like being able to quantify and see progression is very, very relevant, uh, you know, to, to any demographic, but specifically in the context of lifting here, if we can see the numbers go up, then we can control ultimately where we end up. And when you look a little bit deeper and, you know, the more, you know, as you alluded to that you study this topic, you realize that like, well, my goal of, you know, we'll call it place Z over here is more muscle or even just the appearance of more muscle, right? I want to look a particular way. And then over here at A, we have, I'm doing a rep, you know, and there's a lot of things that go into that rep and load being one of them. So we think like in between A and Z, you know, that there's not a whole lot there. If I just add more load, this thing that I can measure, um, then eventually that leads to the Z, you know, the way that I look. And the more we learn, the more we start to clarify this whole black box in terms of things that go into that output that ultimately is at Z. Um, so you, you know, you mentioned some of those before, whether it be, you know, the exercise setup, the execution, people will think of things like, you know, the uh, number of reps they're doing, the effort they're doing, the tempo and the list goes on and on and on about the inputs 
that we can have that ultimately affect the stimulus, which leads to the outcome, uh, in this case, muscle growth that we're looking for. So I think just as far as like defining terms here, when we say progressive, we think about something that, uh, you know, is potentially increasing or moving in a direction over time and overload, meaning, you know, more load, in this case, more stress. And when we talk about load from a physiological standpoint, it doesn't really mean weight per se. Load in this context really just means stress. So we want to uh, increase or move in a specific direction of, of stress over time. And um, like you mentioned before, there's a, a lot of ways to potentially uh, achieve uh, those different types of stress. Uh, um, and, you know, before I go too deep, you know, down this rabbit hole, I'll, I'll give, you know, either Ben or Andrew just a second to um, ask any questions, like just cut me off here and, and just make sure that like you're following where I'm at to this point. Yeah, um, I think an important caveat to make here is the really the the, the rationale behind why this topic of or conceptualization of progressive overload uh, has become a topic of conversation to begin with like why is it important as a topic and I think that the name is kind of a misnomer in many ways because especially with this framework also that or this paradigm really that Ethan is laying out of you know progressive stress more than progressive overload I almost like in relationship to the actual you know weight topic um, I like to almost think about it as more reactive than than progressive, because what ultimately you're actually doing is, you know, let's say you're doing a row exercise and you do sets with 100 pounds and you and you do those sets for, you know, uh, uh, failure, whatever it happens to be. Eventually, if you do that exercise over and over and over again and you only use 100 pounds on that exercise, you'll eventually get to a point where you're probably instead of doing 10 or 15 reps where you're doing 15, 30, 40. Right. And, and eventually it's like, you know, it's like when you get really good at pushups, you just, you have to find ways to make the push up harder or else it's impractical. So it's almost like adding weight or adding load to an exercise is more like a reaction to the exercise getting too easy. Right. Obviously you don't want to be at a point where you're not, you're just doing easy sets. Right. Which is why you sort of preemptively be like, okay, I can imagine making this amount of load progression across this week. But to me, it's like, it's more people look at it in the sense of like, Oh, I need to add more load so that I can grow more rather than uh, I need to add more load because that's what the stimulus necessitates at this, at this time, given my progression. Right. So to me, it's like, the only reason we we talk about this in the first place is because we need to keep stressors higher, relatively speaking, because if we do the same stress or we perform the same exercise with the same weight over and over, we, we don't, you know, presumably get too far unless some other variable, you know, we're, we're toggling up, you know, PEDs, food being other examples. So I think that's an important caveat to make just in, in terms of like why it's important and how maybe this sort of reframing paradigm uh, is useful as a concept is because it, we're not looking at load. We're looking at, like Ethan said, stress. And uh, I, again, I personally like to think of it specifically when it comes to actually developing the skill as like the skill of any motion comes first. And then whatever load is appropriate for the skill, given the amount of reps that I want to do, that's the thing that I pick. It's like the load to me is almost always an afterthought of what is, uh, you know, the skill that I want to perform and what is the relative intensity, the amount of reps, you know, basically laying out the constraints first and then allowing whatever load is appropriate for that rather than thinking what is the load first and then sort of, you know, reacting to my fuck up down the line of me adding an arbitrary amount of weight when, you know, I wasn't really reacting to what I needed. I was trying to just guess. So just maybe a, a caveat there for more, for more context. Um, yeah. And in the sense of, uh, sorry to cut you off there, Ethan, um, in the sense of like what you said, like adding more stress, where do, where do intensive intensity boosters fall in, in the sense of like drop sets, um, rest pause sets and stuff like that. Like where necessarily would you, I guess, program that, but um, how does that um, affect this whole progressive, progressive overload uh, thing that we're trying to accomplish? 
So, yeah, you know, when I was first introduced to the, um, the concept of intensity as an exercise science student, um, it was always taught to me as, as intensity being a percentage of your maximum. And most of the time, the context was a percentage of the maximum load you can lift. Again, when I say load here, I'm actually referring to weight in this instance. So uh, uh, typically in weightlifting, powerlifting circles, when they said intensity, it really meant the percentage of your one rep max. A lot of times for context, when we say intensity here, what we're talking about is the intensity of effort. So how close to your maximum effort are we applying? And another way to say that could be like uh, reps in reserve, RIR, or it could be ratings of perceived exertion, but it's really a scale of effort. And when we do things like rest, pause, drop sets, these things that we call intensity techniques, you know, they're really providing more, more of a subjective experience of effort. And um, in, do, in doing so, typically we will add additional stimulus. So I think one important piece of context here, and this kind of ties into the, the biomechanics realm as well, is that we can never really we can never do more than our current capabilities. So some people will say like, well, I did a set to failure and then I went beyond failure, right? There's no such thing as beyond failure. There's only what you can do. If someone is, you know, helping you with that load, if you're doing a drop set, the only reason you can do it is because the load is getting lighter. Whether that's because you're getting help, whether that's because you're decreasing the weight, whether that's because you are resting more, you're never running faster uh, than your maximal sprint speed. And I say this ties into the biomechanics realm because this is, this is something, you know, that Tom talks about as well is like, you know, your maximum uh, is your maximum in order to uh, exceed your current maximum. It's not doing more than your maximum. We are always training under our maximum. And that's where this concept of stimulus really comes into play. So I'll, I'll come back around, but the concept of, you know, progressive overload here, um, a lot of the early theory for that came from a guy named Hans Selye, who was not in fitness at all, but many, you know, Ben's listeners will recognize that name. He developed something called the general uh, adaptation syndrome. Um, and basically, you know, in short, it's like you provide a stressor, there's a, you know, a response or an alarm phase there. And then there's, um, you know, if you're able to adapt to that, there is, you know, a long term or chronic adaptation. And I'm really, really boiling down here. But it's basically how we think about uh, how we think about stress, like totally outside of exercise. And and it, the idea was this would kind of apply, again, general adaptation syndrome to, you know, anything we do in life. There's an acute stressor. And if we can survive that stressor, most of our biological systems function in such a way that they will become more robust or you will um, not survive that stressor. Um, and, you know, this is kind of, you know, one of the ways that we may have traditionally looked at injury. This is one of the ways we've looked, you know, at response, uh, you know, to progressive overload. And, you know, I think the model uh, is useful and it very much has this concept behind it that, again, sort of like going off of the, you know, Arnold mentality of like, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And there, you know, are lots of stories, whether it be, you know, something that's kind of like a, 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 a fable or something in mythology where it's like, well, every time we cut, you know, Medusa's limb off, you know, she grows another one. And we have this concept, you know, typi typically early on in our understanding of exercise, we just think of, all right, if I create more damage, if I inflict more destruction, more destruction leads to more rebuilding. If I dig a deeper hole, I can build a bigger, you know, building on top of it. And I think that's how a lot of people conceptualize this idea of progressive overload is in order to progress, I need to mess myself up worse than I messed myself up before. Yeah. And we can see some pretty clear examples of where that's not the case. Um, one easy one is, you know, a study where they gave participants, 
uh, something like five, 600 milligrams of testosterone and they didn't weight train at all. And then another group that weight trained uh, didn't take testosterone. And, you know, this, this study is often cited, but it's just a really easy example um, to show that, yeah, the group that actually received the uh, pretty, um, you know, pretty, pretty modest dose, but significant dose of, you know, anabolic steroids, or in this case, you know, testosterone, which technically is an anabolic steroid, um, they grew more than the group that was weight training. So the group that weight trained without testosterone grew less than the group that didn't weight train with the testosterone. So now you have to, you really have to call into question this idea of the damage and the breakdown and the digging the hole is what's necessary to create the adaptation. So when we start to move away from this, uh, this concept of like the general adaptation syndrome, where we need some type of stressor to sort of push us downwards in order to come back up. And we move more towards a model of what we might call like signal transduction, which is like there is some like think of it like uh, you would think of taking drugs where, you know, you take a drug, it, you know, interacts with a receptor and you get a response and it doesn't necessarily require some sort of um, stress that we perceive as causing like fatigue. Right. So oftentimes when we're searching for, you know, what we're calling overload in this situation, what we're actually finding is more fatigue. And we think of, well, if I generate more fatigue, that means I get more stimulus. And I think it's really important to say that stimulus and fatigue and, you know, someone who's, you know, kind of coined this term, uh, Mike Isertel, I think is important to bring up because he's coined the term stimulus to fatigue ratio. And I think that's very relevant here is like what we're looking to ultimately achieve is a stimulus. What we are often measuring is the fatigue side of it. And we often don't know all of the components that are going into that stimulus side of things, all of the things that are happening in our body. Some things we have an impact over, uh, you know, the food that we're eating, the, you know, the sleep, the, um, you know, the training stimulus, you know, even the environmental factors like our relationships, you know, um, our ability to sense, you know, what's happening in our body, you know, the, the list is endless. Um, but ultimately that black box of stimulus is not something that, you know, we always can measure or have control over. So, Coming back, you know, to this idea of like, what do these, you know, intensity, you know, techniques, you know, offer us and like, where do they come into play in, in the concept of this progressive overload model? You know, if we use the, the drug analogy and we say, all right, like if I take, you know, 10 milligrams of XYZ drug today, does that mean I have to take 11 milligrams tomorrow and 12 milligrams the next day? No, we know that like there are some drugs that, you know, sort of decrease, um, that, that we sort of sensitize to over time and that we may need to increase the dose. But there are lots of situations and long periods of time that we can go with a relatively even stimulus. And um, that this idea of, you know, progressively overloading, overstressing your body is not necessarily something that's so acute on a week to week basis. It's something that, you know, we observe as we get stronger, but we don't necessarily have to uh, prove that we're stronger or display that we're stronger in order, you know, to create that response. And when, you know, it comes to these, you know, intensity or really like effort uh, related um, techniques like the drop sets, like the, you know, rest pause, like I think what we get more than anything out of these is just an efficient way to accumulate more stress. So most of them are time related. Like we could easily just, you know, instead of doing a drop set, a drop set is typically just a set that is lighter done immediately after a set that was heavier. Um, you could also rest two minutes and do the same way or rest two minutes and do a lighter way. But because you didn't rest, we call it a distinct thing. Uh, rest pause because is just a drop set where you use the same weight. You didn't rest, 
and then you did, <laughs> you know, you rested less and then you do another one. So, and you know, a assisted rep, you're benching, you can't do the last rep, your partner helps you with it. That's a drop set. Um, they are really all just ways, uh, in my opinion, at least the stuff that I've mentioned so far and being more time efficient, um, to, you know, impose a, a, a greater stress load on your body. So, um, I don't think there's anything unique about any of them. I, I really just think that they are tools that you can use to be more time efficient, uh, in imposing, you know, more and more stress, you know, in your program over time. Gotcha. And I think that part of the reason too, that people maybe view those things as distinct is because we really like to give names to things and because things are different names, then, you know, they must be distinct and at least in principle, uh, or at least we think. And I think that the fatigue accumulation conversation is a really good one. And one of the other questions that um, Andrew had was in relationship to biomechanics and its role in, in injury prevention. Um, which I think as a concept in terms of how it relates to this progressive overload topic is uh, really directly related. Uh, Andrew, just briefly, is there anything that you wanted to contextualize that with before I uh, jump to it a little bit? Yeah, like injury prevention, like how, how does the, like mostly, I guess, training execution um, set up and all that, how does, how important is that to obviously preventing injury? Yeah, so one of the things that Ethan was mentioning was, you can't, you know, run f faster than you can run that, that, that whole idea of like, you can't actually do more than you can do when you fail, you know, and you, and you go beyond quote, beyond failure, you're not going beyond failure. You're still the only, you know, by definition you can't. Right. So I think that when you look at the injury equation, like what really is an injury, an injury is going beyond like literally going beyond a failure point, right? So whether it's a more chronically sort of building thing or whether it's like, oh shit, you know, I'm doing this stupid incline elbow wrapped bench press and I tear my pec off uh, because, uh, you know, I'm filming something for the gram. Those, you know, appear to be on a very significant uh, or a significantly different spectrum, but they're really just on the same spectrum on a different timeline, right? So whether it's like just slowly over time, you, you, um, you get to a point where, you know, uh, you, you can't get up out of bed in the morning, or it's just like, again, an acute thing. I think the, the equation that we can kind of use to conceptualize injury is just what is the applied force relative to the tolerance of the tissue, right? So what is the amount of stress that I'm imposing relative to the amount of stress that I can actually recover from, and then hopefully move forward from. So this whole idea of progressive overload is directly related because if you, for whatever, you know, in, in whatever combination of things, whether it be volume, uh, load, reps, execution, all these, all these things ultimately come back to that idea of tolerance and what biomechanics or rather the understanding of biomechanics really does as it relates to injury and this whole conversation is it gives you a potentially more accurate starting point um, for which to pursue this this concept as a whole so to give a more specific example um if i am going to do a dumbbell press okay and there are you know an infinite number of potential iterations that you could perform a dumbbell press you could you could you know have a wider arm path you could have a narrower arm path you could do it so that you're on an incline or that you're on a flat or so that you're um you know the, the load is closer to your shoulder or closer to, your, to being on top of your elbow right a million different ways to do it and every potential iteration of that dumbbell press is doing something slightly different from an applied force perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, there are certain positions that you could move your arm in that dumbbell press that would apply specific forces to your shoulder that are distinct from other positions in that, in that motion. So if I'm doing a super wide press, that's very distinct from if I'm doing a little bit more of a sort of comfortable, you know, more adducted arm path press. The major distinction between having your arm up here and having your arm here from a tissue standpoint is that your pecs have a much uh, longer moment arm in, 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 the, um, in the lower arm position, at least if you were to add up all, if we could find a way to add up the leverage of all of the different pecs, all the different pecs have a greater moment arm in terms of actually acting on the shoulder and the shoulder girdle in a slightly more relatively adductive position as in this position. So that doesn't mean that as soon as you do 
a wider press, your shoulder is going to explode and you're going to get elbow cancer. But what it does mean is that the threshold for um, tolerance is going to be lower. Okay. So if I have a tissue that's in a, that's in a more mechanically advantaged position, right, it's capable most likely of taking more load before it potentially fails. So what we see a lot of times with just in, you know, sort of the Instagram TikTok sphere where people are, are tearing their packs. I'm sure you've seen some of those videos, right? Where people, mm -hmm. you know, they have elbow wraps and they have a fucking slingshot on maybe. And, you know, their partner is basically like lifting the bar for them. They assume this really, really wide arm path because usually they're using a barbell, right? And a lot of times what happens in this wider arm path position is the amount of muscular torque that you can create just from a total, you know, what are my shoulder flexors doing standpoint, the total torque production capability in this position is lower than in this position. So what that means is that you actually need a lower amount of load for an equal or greater amount of stress specifically on your shoulder. And we could get into what, you know, the specific forces at whatever times. I don't think that's as relevant as, as the conversation around what biomechanics does and what an understanding of it does is it essentially raises the threshold for the potential of injury, meaning that you have more wiggle room when you're putting your muscles in more directly advantaged positions relative to if you are, again, you know, doing something like the wider press. So to me, it's basically just gives you much more of a buffer between, and, it, and also because it gives you a much bigger buffer, it gives you a much better, um, I'll say perception, or it, it gives you a much longer timeline uh, within which you can actually observe, like, what are the effects of these things? So if you're doing a largely mechanically, what I would call or label a mechanically appropriate setup, and you have some deviation from that setup, that's like, oh, this kind of thing is bugging me a little bit. It's like, you can, you can kind of get a sense for that. And it's like a little bit of a gentle, like nudge, like, oh, you know, maybe my arm is a little bit, you know, uh, uh, too wide here. I'll just move it here. And that now it's totally fine. A lot of times you don't get that buffer or that wiggle room in an exercise that's really poorly set up. It's almost like it didn't hurt at all. And now it's like the, you know, the, the, the second that I went down to do this eccentric portion of the motion, now it's, you know, snap or now it's, you know, seemingly out of nowhere. So, you know, the, the conversation to me is really a conversation around, you know, how, how much you're actually able to uh, create uh, in terms of your um, potential resistance to uh, fatigue and your resistance to, um, uh, tension and putting yourself in more mechanically sound, more mechanically advantaged joint positions essentially just gives you a bigger buffer, not only within a rep or within a set, but across sets and across days and weeks and months mm -hmm. where you able, you're able to gain a much better understanding of what kinds of things you're actually able to tolerate because the the, the sort of feedback that you're getting is, is generally speaking, much less dramatic than if you're in a really compromised joint position, right? That's kind of how injury occurs in sport is you find someone in a very compromised joint position with very high loading, usually that they're haven't, you know, been prepared for. Um, and that's, you know, typically when we see the, the most acute kinds of stresses play out there. Um, yeah. And then obviously the other part of that is just the, the, the specificity with which you can, um, I think, uh, look at an exercise, right? So if, if, if you're understanding of what mechanically in an exercise is happening, uh, is, is higher, right? So if you know, okay, this specific variation is more specific to this tissue versus this other tissue, then what you can do is you can lay out a little bit of a better, more organized uh, framework for, okay, what are the kinds of stresses that I'm imposing and how can I differentiate these stresses over time? So if you were to take two different examples of a pulling motion, if someone were to just say, hey, like, let's do back today. And, you know, maybe the first exercise that you do is like a barbell bent over row. Um, you know, you have an option from there of, okay, do I do like a horizontal machine row or do I go and do a pull down? Now, most people that have thought for any length of time about like what they're actually doing would say, I'm going to go do the pull down because that's more obviously different. But the reason that it's important to, or that it might be important to do the pull down in addition to the horizontal row, instead of just two horizontal rows is not only the fact that you are imposing different stresses on the joints but that you are imposing slightly similar stresses on the joints that do slightly different things, right? So, you know, the muscles involved in a pull down are not totally differentiated from the muscles involved in a horizontal row, but they're differentiated enough in terms of the stress at the shoulder 
that you'll probably gain a more robust stimulus response from that at the same time that your joint stresses are potentially lower from, you know, sort of not doing the same thing over and over again. The example that I sometimes like to give is like, if I were just beating your hand, your left hand with a hammer, you know, would it, would it be better to you if I were to just beat, you know, your, your left hand 10 times or beat your left hand five times, and then maybe your left forearm five times. It's like the approximation of the stress is, is very close in terms of what your perception of where it's happening but it's differentiated enough to maybe where I don't break through the skin or, you yeah. know, break too many bones, I can kind of hit, start to hit somewhere else. So the target, you know, uh, was still falling along the same spectrum of like, both of these things are pulling motions, but from a joint stress perspective, they're dispersed, they're differentiated enough to where, you know, my, my injury potential, I would think in that, in that instance would be lower, just given the difference in the accumulation of those stresses. Gotcha. Uh, Ethan, anything to add there? Anything that comes to mind? I think from a bodybuilding standpoint, when we talk about specificity, it's often uh, trying to grow specific tissues. You know, in baseball, maybe it's swinging a bat. In bodybuilding, it might be growing, you know, a pack or even, you know, trying to focus on uh, a specific division there, if, uh, if you believe in that sort of thing. <laughs> um so, yeah, when it comes to the specificity of training a given muscle group, we've already then defined that we have the potential for overuse in that area. So I think that's where biomechanics, you know, can be really useful in terms of getting a, a stimulus to an area, in this case, a specific muscle group, but being able to differentiate uh, the joint stresses that we're accumulating when we do it. So oftentimes people will do several different exercises that they perceive to be different, either uh, different from a muscular standpoint in terms of, let's say, like different divisions of the pack or even different muscle groups altogether. Let's say, you know, more focused on like a tricep bias or an anterior delt bias. Um, if what we think we're doing by picking different exercises is differentiating either, you know, the, the muscular or, you know, joint stresses, but actually we're being very repetitive. Not only do we have the inability to focus on the growth of a specific tissue, but also by being more specific and trying to accumulate more stress in that area, um, if we are repetitively doing the same type of insult over and over again, uh, you know, we are going to be limited in our capacity, you know, for stress or, you know, volume tolerance in that area. So I think biomechanics really, really comes into play more and more as um, you're trying to get more specific in terms of what the, the target is. And as I mentioned earlier with the analogy of like moving from grade school, um, you know, to getting your doctorate or, you know, moving from an early stage generalized athlete to a very uh, specific uh, high level athlete, um, things always become, you know, more and more specific, more and more targeted over time. And again, with that progressive, you know, overload nature, um, through many different means, we are going to impose, we're going to have to impose, you know, a greater and greater stress. And in order to be able to survive that stress, we have to be very specific about where we apply it and at what doses we apply it. So we have to have some, you know, tools to sort of monitor potentially when we're crossing uh, the tipping point at a given tissue, uh, whether that be a stimulus from a muscular growth standpoint, or whether that be a, a side effect per se from a, a joint health standpoint. Um, I think that kind of takes us a little bit into one of the things you had mentioned earlier, Andrew, about, um, you know, overtraining and, you know, potentially like how we, um, you know, mitigate that whole like uh, stimulus uh, to, you know, fatigue concept in, you know, bodybuilders, uh, you know, high level athletes that, you know, are really trying to, you know, push the needle and, you know, oftentimes encounter sort of the proverbial uh, edge to the cliff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think just as a last note on that, before we maybe get into a little bit of over overtraining stuff, like what we're calling overtraining, because I know that was, as you mentioned, uh, Ethan, like one of Andrew's uh, topics is I think a lot of questions come up about, um, especially recently about like, 
long versus short muscle length stuff and like um you know training the short why would i train the short position you know if i can just do the lengthened position because the lengthened position is better right that's kind of like what people are interpreting the current uh you know quote yeah. data to to be saying and I think that this conversation really speaks to what the biggest benefit of understanding the muscle length thing actually is. It's not really in, I think, necessarily directly to outcome, but more so in mitigating uh, uh, downsides and mitigating potential stresses that we don't want to see. So, you know, if you could just simply do, um, you know, RDLs, because RDLs, you know, target a more length, you know, stiff leg RDLs target a more lengthened position, or maybe a better example would be uh, seated leg, uh, seated leg curl versus lying leg curl, right? Because there's direct study on that. People look at the study that says, oh, you know, the seated leg curl uh, produced more robust hypertrophy response than the lying leg curl. Therefore, you should never do the lying leg curl. Uh, and and this is an actual claim made by people. It's not like a, a hypothetical scenario that I'm making up. It's like people now say you should not ever do the lying leg curl when you could just do the seated one. And I think that the reason that's actually, I mean, on some level, it's like if you have no idea how to in, interpret data and, and there's no degree of really nuance that you can apply to that scenario, I can understand how that's a takeaway. But I think in this particular context, what the, uh, in, just in terms of the the fatigue conversation and, and the injury prevention stuff, I think that's where understanding that like, oh, the lying leg curl will train actually a different position of, of the hamstrings. And not only will it chain train a different position of the hamstrings, but it will also train this other muscle uh, to, you know, in a greater length the sartorius, which is a uh, both a hip uh, flexor and a knee flexor, right? So there are other elements involved in exercises outside of just the specific tissues that we're looking at. And that's a potential thing to uh, help us understand that although in a one-to-one -one scenario, this, this one exercise may be better, um, over the long, medium to long term, what you may actually observe are, are joint stresses that accumulate that are that are very, very similar over time. And not only joint stresses that occur that are similar over time, but just muscular, you know, I don't want to say strength and balances, right? But you're essentially neglecting uh, training specific tissues in specific positions, which I can't help but think over, again, a medium to long term sort of scenario will actually lower the degree of buffer that we have in being more resilient. So, you know, this conversation, I think, is is closely linked to the one around the, you know, the biomechanics uh, and and the injury one is because the muscle length conversation can can tell us a little bit about hypertrophy outcomes. But I think it's almost more important from the perspective of like our orthopedic health and training muscles, not only through their individual full ranges and their full contractile ranges, but just differentiating enough to where, you know, our goals are similar. You're training hamstrings in both the seated and lying leg curl, but the joint stresses that occur at the hips, you know, for instance, are, are totally different between the two, right? So the goals are overlapping in a lot of ways, uh, but in terms of the joint stresses are, are not very similar, uh, at least from, from a hip-based perspective. And so both of those things can move you toward your goal, while still um, accomplishing, you know, what you're trying to accomplish within that session. And I think that that's something that in terms of the length conversation is not often linked to the conversation around fatigue and overtraining uh, and, and, and injury and all those things. So um, Ethan, you had mentioned uh, overtraining as, as, a, as a concept and Andrew had a question about overtraining in terms of, you know, the specifics around um, uh, effective strategies for preventing overtraining. Uh, and, and I think a potentially a, a good way to maybe go about addressing that conversation is to, to kind of talk a little bit about like what overtraining actually is uh, and specifically, uh, you know, in, in, in your previous experience, what overtraining has or what your perception over overtraining has potentially caused uh, and the things that you really pay attention to now uh, uh, to mitigate risk of overtraining. Yeah. So again, coming from the like sports performance realm, you know, with, you know, degree in exercise science, overtraining looked at through a performance lens is really just the point, not only where uh, performance has plateaued, but potentially where you're seeing a decrement in performance. So there's some type of chronic decrement in performance. And again, that comes back to what we were talking about earlier of being able to measure something. 
you know, we, you know, we don't really know uh, if something exists, if we can on some level measure it. So from the sports performance realm, we tend to focus on performance outcomes because at least on the surface, you know, the uh, appearance of performance, you know, as, as again, Tom might say, the appearance of something, what we believe to be seeing with performance seems to be a decrement. Um, I think in the physique realm, it's important to separate this idea of performance and stimulus. I think you could very much design a, a program where the appearance of performance does not necessarily go up, whether that be in an acute uh, standpoint from workout to workout, um, or even you know chronically in, in the ways we might typically measure it. Um, you may not have a traditional sense, like we were talking earlier with progressive overload, that you know performance is changing. And that does not necessarily mean that the stimulus or the outcome, again, that Z point of how we look doesn't change. Because inside that, that black box of what that stimulus is doing in our body, all these sort of chemical signaling that's happening, there are a lot of variables that are in between, you know, what we do, um, you know, in a given set or what the perception of our performance is on a particular set and that outcome of, you know, how we look at the end of the day. So as I mentioned to start, um, the idea of overtraining is usually related to a performance decrement. Some of the things that we use to measure overtraining um, that aren't necessarily quantitative gym measurements or um, quantitative measurements that we might take with a, uh, you know, a piece of technology, like for example, heart rate variability is one that was very popular for a long time. Uh, blood work is another common example of, of using technology to, to monitor um, fatigue. Um, but really the most common thing that you see in the research having a correlation to overtraining is actually uh, subjective markers. So still to this day, the strongest relationship we have with like predicting fatigue really comes down to how a person's feeling is, you know, having a conversation, you know, either, you know, with yourself, you know, with your client athlete and identifying things like the desire to train. Uh, identifying things um, like levels of anxiety or feelings of control, like we talked about earlier. Again, athletes, you know, tend to be people who want to have, you know, some high degree of self-efficacy where we can control the outcome. We enjoy training. So if we have a loss of those feelings of control and we have a loss of desire to train, and we're no longer making progress, those are some pretty good signs that we're starting to go in the wrong direction. Yes. Um, so that's really like how I would begin to uh, to measure uh, overtraining in, in, in a broad kind of like sports performance lens. Um, again, before you know, I continue down that rabbit hole, I just wanted to pass the mic over to Andrew to kind of let him clarify and anything specifically in that realm that he wanted to talk about. No, I've actually felt that before. I've actually felt like um, there was a phase I did one time where my rep ranges were crazy high. I was doing sometimes like 25, you know, 20 rep, 20 reps per an exercise. And I literally lost the desire to want to go into the gym after a couple of weeks because I'm just like, fuck, man, I got to go do this, these six exercises for 30 reps each. And it's like, you know, so I, I completely understand where like what you're saying of measuring it, you know, myself saying like, all right, if I'm losing the desire to want to train, I'm probably overtraining here, you know? Yeah. And, you know, we see a difference too, between like some of these acute variables of fatigue and more chronic variables of fatigue, you know? So you'll hear things like, you know, this increases growth hormone, so it's good, or this increases cortisol, so it's bad. And, you know, the context there is always just acute versus chronic. And, and in what scenario is this happening? So if a sauna, for example, increases your growth hormone, you know, is that really a signal for growth? Or maybe does growth hormone do more things besides quote unquote growth? And, you know, I kind of alluded sarcastically to, you know, the answer there, but it do more things than that. Um, 
<laughs> Same thing with cortisol, right? Like if we look at it as the enemy, because, you know, long-term elevations, you know, in stress hormones, you know, have, um, you know, influence like potentially negative influences to our health. Um, it's short-sighted to think that, you know, bringing cortisol levels down acutely is necessarily the, you know, solution uh, to that problem. So much in the same way here, when we talk about fatigue, when we measure fatigue in a research setting, oftentimes they're very acute variables. You know, it might be um, longer, like it may be on the level of days where we're like, oh, this person got more sore doing this. Um, that's a subjective marker, but we also may have a more objective marker, like measuring something like creatine kinase in the blood work, like I talked about a minute ago with using technology to measure fatigue. Um, we, um, we can look at fatigue on a more acute level, again, with performance being a big marker and say, okay, on an acute level, I do a set of bench press to failure. I rest three minutes and my performance goes down versus if I didn't do a set to failure, my performance wouldn't go down as much. And that, that's pretty predictable. And what you mentioned, Andrew, about like doing high reps and feeling very fatigued, you know, that can happen on a chronic level, but also on a very acute level. So when you look at research comparing like very low rep, high load training versus moderate rep training versus very low load uh, high rep training, you tend to see both ends of the spectrum being fatiguing for different reasons. So people will use the terms like central and peripheral fatigue to say like when we're training very heavy, there's this sense of like just feeling kind of burned out, you know, psychologically, like just having to get up for really heavy weights, you know, it just takes this like toll from your soul. And we kind of uh, call that central fatigue. And then this like peripheral fatigue where, you know, maybe we're doing really high reps, we're building up, you know, high degree of like acidosis and hydrogen ions. And we have this experience of just like feeling, you know, tired uh, from like a, maybe a bioenergetic standpoint, or just being like, just the fucking thought of either lifting something very, very heavy, or the thought of getting under a bar for, you know, a minute plus set is very daunting. Yeah. And um, I would say for one, like the body and, you know, the mind have a pretty amazing ability to adapt. And it can be that over time, you can just get used to those type of uh, stresses, but pretty predictably and pretty like um, intuitively, we know that living on either end of those spectrums is difficult to sustain. And I think we have the evidence both in practice and research to say that like, if your goal is building muscle mass and, you know, the stimulus that we need to produce muscle mass can be relatively nonspecific, meaning it doesn't have to be really low reps, high load, or very high reps, low load. It can be somewhere in the middle, somewhere on either side of it. People tend to lean in the direction of like, well, let's just kind of do a little bit of everything. And as the person becomes more advanced, has more specific needs, is going through specific training cycles, we may decide to choose one or the other based ultimately on like what their limitations are. But I think one of the biggest things, you know, that you find when talking about training fatigue, which ultimately accumulates into, uh, you know, overtraining or, you know, a decrement in the, you know, physical performance, the mental, you know, aptitudes or what have you, um, we are really often looking at like, what is this person's weak spot? what is the weak link in the chain? And one of the first things uh, I talked about with you, Andrew, was like, what's broken you so far? That's one of the questions that I often ask during consults in some way, shape or form is like, if you get someone and you ask that question in, in some way to say like, tell me about what your limitations have been. When you go through a training block and you've overdone it, what breaks? And some people will tell you, you know, in, in one way or nothing or one way or another that nothing really breaks. Like, I what do you mean? Like, I just train, you know, I just, and that probably tells you a, a little bit about like how much effort and how extreme they've gone into the process. Anyone who's gone through, you know, a high degree of effort and specificity in a task will tell you where they break because in 
getting, you know, in climbing that mountain, um, you ultimately just incur costs along the way. And those costs accumulate. And even your best attempts to be able to predict uh, where that tipping point is uh, usually, um, you know, are usually you overshoot at some point and you miscalculate where you're at, you know, uh, on that spectrum. So when I, that question is always very helpful for me in consultations. It, it first tells you just kind of like, you know, maybe how advanced someone is in their journey. Um, but also there can be people that have made lots of progress and run into very little, very little obstacles along the way. And it, and it may just tell you how robust they are in particular ways. There are plenty of people who pay very little attention, you know, to biomechanics and survive it despite the fact. And that again, can be because of, you know, specific genetic factors, specific environmental factors. Like there are a lot of reasons why someone may be able to, uh, you know, survive something that someone else is not, but ultimately somewhere within them, there's going to be something that breaks in the quest to get there. So the things that you had mentioned so far were like digestive health, uh, you know, was a potential limiter. And it's a limiter because in order to get that stimulus, you need to be able, the, the stimulus being, you know, for muscle growth, um, you need to be able to adequately get the nutrients, uh, you know, some people will call them like the building blocks, so to speak, to be able to, um, you know, create the adaptation of muscle growth that you're looking for. Um, for a lot of people listening to Ben, those limiter, that limiter might be at a specific joint. And that specific joint is keeping them from being able to progress. And their limiter is when I push really hard, uh, especially at this specific activity, I always break, you know, at this joint. So I think really the conversation comes down to identifying the person's specific limiters and people, again, based on their genetics, their history are always going to have something that corresponds to their specific goal that gets in the way. And you're going to work around that. And I think more often than not, we're working around limiters and we're programming based on that um, rather than sort of like playing the upside and thinking like, how do I, you know, do the most everywhere? We're often thinking about how do I mitigate, you know, this limiter stopping me from progressing um, whilst, you know, pushing the stimulus, you know, everywhere else. So that's where that kind of, you know, creative problem solving comes in. And that's where, understanding biomechanics, understand, you know, so that we can spread out the stress or be specific where we place that stress, understanding, you know, nutritionally, like what would constitute a, you know, a gut stressor for this person under these conditions. Mm -hmm. And as we become more and more specific with understanding where that person uh, maybe has a weak link and what are the things that specifically um, stress that weak link, then we become more and more nuanced in our approach and we begin to understand also then the timelines that that type of stuff falls under. And more and more over time, we start to color in this picture. Okay, for this person, we have this timeline. This is the thing that's likely going to break under that timeline. So here's the runway we have to get there. And I would say just and in a closing thought here, um, no matter how you know gifted the person is that you're working with, for me, it's always more of a game of like, you know, tortoise versus the hare. It's got some input too. Come here. Come here. Come here. Here we go. You're going to meet my dog. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a game of like the tortoise uh, versus the hare for me, where, you know, ultimately, like you had mentioned early on, Andrew, this is a long-term process. It's years in the making and there's usually considerably more downside to um you know really breaking at that limiter like finding the breaking point of that limiter and having to rebuild from it as you see you know recently where you know you've lost you know 12 pounds or so in the process you know, you're kind of resetting and working back up but there's sure. always much more of a hole to dig out of potentially when you find those breaking points, then there is upside to, you know, trying to get a few extra percent here and there. So yeah. I, I tend to lean more often towards mitigating, um, you know, the downside than playing like the 
extra percentages on the upside. And I would say ultimately with people that are trying to push things, you know, at a high, high level, the desire to find upside and the desire for that, those extra percentage points at the top is always there. So inevitably we're just going to regress towards that regress towards trying to push things further than we should. So we often don't really have to worry about like, is, is that desire going to be there? Like, are we going to push things hard enough? If you're someone who, you know, is going to have the physical and, you know, emotional capabilities to achieve high level sports performance, most likely that mindset is already ingrained and most likely, you know, in more cases than not, uh, it's going to be pulling back from that, not necessarily trying to play, you know, the small percentage points on the upside. Gotcha. So, I wanted to just briefly touch on one more thing here today because we're coming up on almost two hours now. So it's been a hefty, very hefty hefty time here. Um, uh, So one of the other things, and this will overlap, not so surprisingly with everything else we've been talking about is this idea or this topic of um, muscle imbalance. And, um, and I think that it's a it's it's an important um, topic to discuss because it's often like many of these other things that have names just thrown around as kind of a smoke bomby type of term to um, answer questions that um, we know we have no certain answers to. So just um, before I um, cover anything in relationship to it, when Andrew, when you were asking about muscle imbalance. Um, what, what did you mean by muscle imbalance? And, uh, was it like, so is it more of a, a visual thing? Is it more of like a, you know, 10 sets of pulling and therefore 10 sets of pushing type thing? Like, what were you really, what direction did you want to go with that? Uh, I think it's more of like a lot of times I hear it thrown around in the sense of more of like, you know, my right side's weaker than the left, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Like, I also see a lot of, uh, trainers, you know, trying to make everybody completely symmetrical, completely perfect and balanced, you know, one side's, you know, be just as strong as the other by doing more sets on this other side or something like that, you know, and mm-hmm. kind of like I've, I've learned from you recently um, that really there are no such thing as uh, or muscle imbalances are completely normal, right? And I uh, just kind of wanted you to kind of go a little deeper into that and understanding not only for myself, but for other people out there as well, because I feel like it's, it's like functional training. I feel like this is just thrown out there a lot just to like, make people feel better that they're doing the right thing and gonna you know make them completely equal on both sides and i just not only learning from you and learning from tom and, and other people that you know most imbalances are completely normal just like our organs are completely Im- imbalanced right like we have more organs on our left side than our right side and um and all that so just wanted you wanted to ask this question only to understand a little bit deeper myself but um for every, all the other trainers out there as well that that kind of believe in that kind of stuff Yeah, I think that the starting point for this is, you know, kind of just to define, you know, what we mean by balance. And I think what a lot of people think of when they think of muscular balance, at least in part is visual, which to some degree, if you're a bodybuilder is understandable, but I'll touch on that later. But also just in terms of the actual function of the muscle, like what is meant by balance is really like, well, I want, you know, I want uh, you know, things on this side of the joint to act in the same way that things on this other side of the joint are acting. So, you know, the, the most commonly referred to example is like hamstrings versus quads. And people are like, oh my God, I'm so quad dominant. I need to build my hamstrings or, you know, I'm an athlete and I tear my hamstring. It's because I'm quad dominant. And I think most of the time, what people are referring to in those instances is really what they're doing is they're describing the existing architecture of the muscle groups and the relationship between muscle groups. So most of your quads, for example, don't cross your hip. Only one of them does. Uh, All of your hamstrings, except for one, cross your hip, right? Um, So just right off the bat, even if you, if you looked at that difference in, um, uh, structure in terms of origin insertion, there's already a difference there, right? So even if there's one difference and 99 similarities, fundamentally the the groups are different and and therefore, at least to me, shouldn't be balanced in any sort of real sense. Now, when you even start to look at things like muscle architecture, right? Clearly, like even if you know nothing about anatomy, if you look at a picture of a, you know, a, a 
a cadaver, a textbook depiction of a cadaver, um, you know, you very quickly realize that like the the actual specific architecture, not only in the ter in terms of, you know, fiber type distribution, but also just how long, you know, the fibers span within the actual muscle, uh, what the orientation of the fibers is relative to the bones that they sit on, the joints that they cross, what joint actions do they create, what joint actions are they better and worse at, how do the fibers uh, relate to one another, right? So the quads are uh, a muscle group that is meant to be uh, a highly, uh, we'll call it uh, uh, power producing, you know, a, a very much a power producing strength producing muscle group, because so many of the fibers are oriented in such a way where so many of them, so many more fibers are packed into the same amount of space on the front side of the femur, as opposed to the back side of the femur. And so, you know, we could just go on and on with the descriptions of like, okay, well, the quads use the patella, you know, as an anatomical pulley, the hamstrings don't. Uh, there are multiple other knee flexors involved in um, in a knee flexion type motion, right? The gastroc, um, you know, the pocleteus to some degree. So it's like, even if you were to try to measure these things, and even if you were to try to say, okay, here's how I'm, you know, here's how much torque that I'm able to produce, uh, you know, when I do a leg curl versus a leg extension, like, should those things be similar? Because not only are all of these things architecturally very different, uh, and functionally very different to, to use the word functionally, uh, again, um, but the actual length changes in the muscles relative to the positions that you're doing uh, or using are different. So it's just everything about the idea of balance as it relates to the body is, is, is erroneous in terms of any assumptions about what should or shouldn't be balanced from a, just a baseline architectural structural perspective. But then also when we look at like even beginning to measure these things, it's like the only actual measurement that people are, are using for this stuff is their subjective measurement, right? It's like, how do I, you know, feel about the strength of this thing? Like, what does this thing look like? Why should these things look this will look the same if architecturally they're completely different? Um, why should they be the same strength, you know, given all these other factors? So I think that the idea of balance, at least, uh, you know, from a non-visual perspective, I think it's, I think it's a uh, kind of a dog chasing its tail sort of a thing um, where, you know, people are, people just subscribe to an idea and then look for a reason, you know, after they've subscribed to the idea to kind of justify their beliefs rather than the other way around where it's like they're actually running into a problem and they're solving a problem based on fixing some kind of imagined, you know, uh, imbalance. And, you know, we could go on and on with all different joints and all different examples, but I think the, the one that I gave was hopefully elucidate some, uh, uh, some clarity about that whole discussion. Um, and then I think the only other thing that I wanted to, to touch on was in relationship to the, the first part of that, which was like, you know, one side is weaker than the other kind of a thing. Uh, and, you know, obviously we only really clearly observe that with unilateral type exercises. So single arm rows, pull downs, single leg, leg extension, leg curl, whatever. And I think that, you know, for the most part, it's never something to really freak out about. Uh, if, if it's a, if it's a difference, usually the difference doesn't last particularly long in my experience. Um, if the distance, is, if the difference is more drastic, right? So, you know, you're doing rows and on one side, you're getting 15 reps and on the other side, you're getting like, uh, you know, six to eight and both of them are at failure. That's usually something that I look at more so to begin with from a setup perspective, because people I think naturally have differences between sides. And that's really just a product of us being righties and lefties. And that's a totally normal, useful thing. Um, and very quickly uh, that those skill differences tend to tend to sort of work themselves out in terms of actual concrete application and what I would do in those scenarios, I would say I would always, I would almost always start with what I perceive to be the weaker side and usually match reps with the other side. Um, in the case where, you know, the stimulus, it's like, I'm roughly at failure anyway, on both sides. Uh, something that Ethan and I were talking about last week was actually um, he, he had noticed that when he was doing one side first, um, he would actually, in terms of the total volume, or this is with your client specifically, e, but, uh, you know, what the, the side that got more reps in, on the first set, I think, uh, you would, you would, you would think like, okay, you know, this side is doing less work and therefore I need to do an extra set or I need to do more reps or whatever it is. Um, but what I think Ethan was describing that he found was that it, when he had looked at the total volume in terms of the total reps 
between both legs throughout uh, the sets. Both of them ended up very similar in terms of the total rep count and then potentially, therefore, the total amount of stimulus. So I really, most of the time, don't think it's something to even be concerned about. And at the end of the day, again, if you're talking visual imbalance, I, I'm really yet to see uh, you know, people get to the level that Ethan is at uh, and, and find that like, you know, they just have this massive gap in this one, in this one muscle group. And then even if they did, uh, like sort of changing that to any degree, uh, beyond what you can control genetically, doesn't seem to be, you know, you don't see guys on the Olympia stage with like this one, you know, rear delt that's like three times the size of the other, you know, because they have this imbalance. And most of the time too, you only see people in those instances, the people that are claiming that they have a visual imbalance they themselves are the only people that can really easily identify the visual imbalance more than anyone else, much less, you know, a judge or something. So those, those are kind of my just thoughts on the balance topic. And then Ethan, if you wanted to kind of wrap it up with any thoughts on that and closing thoughts before we uh, end up here. Yeah, I think that that all made, uh, you know, a lot of sense there. I, I, I totally agree with the observation uh, you know, on the bodybuilding stage where it's like, usually if you see an imbalance between the two sides, that's like drastic, it's because someone, you know, tore a muscle. And, and even then, surprisingly, uh, sometimes it's not even noticeable until it gets pointed out to you, you know, after the show. Um, I have observed, like you mentioned, Ben, um, uh, I have a habit recently of having, you know, or, or I, I should say like, I implement a strategy recently of having clients just not count reps at all. And I'll count the reps for documentation sake. And um, it is really interesting to see just how the perception of a, you know, goal number of reps or the perception of I did this many reps on this side affects uh, how many reps they do on the other side. So I, I very much lean towards focusing on the, the tasks that you're doing right now that could be, you know, uh, in life where it's like, you want to build this business and yeah, eventually you're going to need to, let's say, raise money, you know, hire a bunch of people. There's these like, um, you know, there's these steps that you have to take that are way down the line, but in front of you today, it's just like, you need to go online and create an LLC. And if you think about, you know, the, the steps that are, you know, six months ahead, it seems very overwhelming. How do I get to this point where I build this, you know, multi-million dollar business, but really like the thing in front of you right now, oftentimes is very, very simple and very, very achievable. So I think as, as humans who have this unique ability to be able to sort of project and imagine the future, it's easy to get very, very caught up in, uh, again, sort of coming back to this Arnold idea of, it is me, you know, who creates uh, my future self. And if I know what I want to be, and I just keep, you know, um, you know, pushing in that direction, then I can create that thing. And, and, and you know, I do believe we, we see that a lot, especially if the person is able to realistically uh, identify what their skill set is, right? If they're realistic about what they are talented in and, um, you know, what their skills and environment lend towards, um, I think you can have a, you know, somewhat specific, but reasonably broad idea of the direction you want to go in and day by day execute on those tasks while keeping in mind, you know, the greater goal. Now, bringing this back to more contextually to what we're talking about here, I really like to focus on the individual, you know, units of inputs that we're putting in. So in the gym, the individual unit is the rep. And I think it's really, really important not to focus on like, this is how many reps I'm supposed to be doing, how much weight I'm supposed to be doing, like all of these things that, you know, ultimately get us to this model of progressively doing more. This idea of progressive overload we talked about earlier that I need to do more than I've ever done. And in order to do that, I need to plan to do more than I've ever done. I think what we find in practice is by doing what you have available to you at this moment, doing the thing in front of you the, with the best quality that you can, that you can, 
you accumulate high quality behaviors, in this case, high quality repetitions. And when you do that over and over again, you get to the best place that, you know, your body, your, you know, genetics, your environment, you know, will ultimately allow for. And, you know, whether that be repetitions of swinging a bat or repetitions of lifting a weight, you know, ultimately, if you're specific about what you want to achieve and you do the best quality repetitions, the best quality days, the best quality, you know, meals over and over again, you get some response that you ultimately don't fully control. You know, this idea, like I was talking about earlier of the spectrum from A to Z, where we're trying to get to a particular physique, we don't control our bone structure, we don't control, you know, ultimately, like the shape uh, that our muscles take on, but we do control the individual reps that we do, we do control, like, uh, for the most part, you know, the behaviors that we engage in, you know, the, the foods that we eat. But if we become so focused on, you know, the outcome of doing X amount of reps or, you know, Andrew, in the case of like, you know, gut health, it might be an eating X amount of food and I need to achieve that end point. Oftentimes we lose sight of what's happening, you know, moment to moment. So in having clients not necessarily, you know, count the number of reps they do, I find for a particular demographic of clients, it keeps them very, very focused on the rep that they're doing in that moment and the quality of the repetitions. We can then decide from there, like we talked about earlier, Andrew, this idea of intensity or intensity of effort, we can then decide how much effort we want to put in. So, you know, to Ben's point earlier, the quality of the repetition comes first. Uh, the quality can be determined, you know, by which, you know, exercise we choose to begin with the setup of that exercise and ultimately moment to moment, the decisions we're making, uh, you know, co consciously and uh, unconsciously about um, the way we're, we're moving. Um, as we, you know, accumulate more and more good reps and we decide on what that effort cutoff is, ultimately the outcome of that will be a certain number of reps with a certain load, but we didn't necessarily like, create that outcome that outcome was just kind of the result of focusing on each individual rep so i think when you gear people more towards focusing on the quality behavior and you have some way to look back historically you step back and you measure the response over a longer period of time so instead of checking your body weight every single day Instead of looking back on how many reps you did last week and making sure that you do more today by, you know, eating your meals in the way that you had planned by executing your reps in the way that you have planned and then stepping back, um, whether it be a coach or whether you be, re whether it's you recording data over, you know, a, a more prolonged period of time, you can look back and you can observe the results of that effort. But I think dialing in too close and looking specifically and saying, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be doing more than I did last time. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than just saying, I'm going to do the best quality behavior I can in this moment. And I will look back uh, later and observe the response in, in an appropriate timeline for that behavior. Uh, when you zoom in too much and you say, I'm supposed to weigh more than I did yesterday because my goal is to increase my body weight, just like I'm supposed to do more reps than I did yesterday or add more load than I did yesterday, uh, because my goal is, you know, quote unquote, progressive overload. I think, uh, we actually tend to lose, uh, the individual units, you know, of, of, uh, of quality, the individual units, you know, of progression that live within that model. So yeah. just, you know, as a closing thought, like, I think really, a, a means of progressive overload, uh, a means of, you know, monitoring this, uh, you know, stimulus to fatigue and your, you know, proximity to, to crossing this tipping point, whether it be with your gut or whether it be, you know, at, at a joint level um, is really just focusing on the individual units of stimulus and being able to, you know, institute a high level of quality and step back like you mentioned in the beginning, Andrew, step back over a longer time frame and observe the outcome of that rather than trying to impart that outcome. Yeah. Um, and I think what, what people will see over time is 
when you separate yourself from that outcome, you realize that you're not the total arbiter, you know, of that response that you get, but you can control the individual behaviors that make up that thing. I think you actually tend to find, uh, you know, better results, maybe not even the results or the responses that you predicted, but you tend to ultimately end up in a better place by accumulating, you know, quality uh, repetitions. And those repetitions could be of any unit. Um, I think you, you you tend to end up with the best possible outcome by focusing on the individual repetitions rather than focusing on where you think you should be from an outcome standpoint. All right. Makes sense. Andrew, thanks for coming on, sir. Bunch thanks of interesting topics here. Um, you. If you have any closing thoughts, feel free to give them. But otherwise, we out. Yeah, no, you guys do. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I'm honored to be on this podcast, man. It was great. Thank you, sir.